Um, hi, uh, so I'm Hamad Adade. I'm a member of faculty here at Queen Mary, uh, part of Center for Intelligence Sensing. I'm going to talk to you about uh, one of the projects that uh, we've been doing in the last few months. <coughs> My research mostly centers around the interaction between algorithms and machine learning and systems. So we, what we refer to as user-centered systems. And uh, we, a lot of this uh, goes around data, personal data. So we, in terms of data, we are mainly referring to three types of data. Data about us, which is mostly the data inferred from other people around us. Data generated by us, things that we post online or is generated from our devices, and um, also the data around us, which is things like uh, what we've been discussed today, uh, records that exist about us, or the IoT data and the video camera surveillance data, live streaming data, whatever it could be. So a lot of our research is around how can we make use of this data in the ways that you are not jeopardizing the individual's privacy. So what are the issues in this space? So um, in the last few years, we were doing quite a bit of research on understanding what are the threats of data which is about us. So some people are out there, for example, when just looking at top 1,000 Alexa websites uh, over a duration of time, we could identify uh, nearly 3,000 uh, trackers, uh, and this was two years ago, I'm sure the number is even more now. And uh, also when you kind of try to chase the data and the referrers that, that go between these trackers, there's a very strange and very dense web of communication across these, uh, these people. And in fact, uh, and this is what people refer to usually as the digital footprint, and in fact, in this ecosystem, Google and Facebook, and these are the good guys, because these are the guys that uh, you know who they are, you can go to their website and, I don't know, look at uh, what profile they've made about you. I used to do this as a demo, but I don't do it anymore, because every time you go to Google's thing, there's some weird things that really don't have anything to do uh, with you sometimes, but uh, proving that to the audience uh, seems difficult. Um, so so, so <laughs> I've, stopped do I've stopped doing that demo now. <laughs> Um, and it, yeah, just as an example, like they have some, as part of their thing, they have some music that they think it's a good suggestion for you, but um, yeah, anyway. Um, so yeah, lots of, uh, and then there's also this effort going on in the privacy space that initially people were putting uh, things, extensions like Adblock Plus, basically ad blockers. And then what the industry did is that they introduced ad blocker blockers. So they, you go to a website, they see that, ah, you've got an ad blocker on, so we can't serve you the content because our business model runs on ads. And uh, if, you, if we don't show you ads, we don't make any money. So uh, you, you must have seen this in some internet site, right? So now there's ad blocker blocker blockers. So there's these uh, extensions that pretend they've shown the ad, but they don't actually show the ad. And this arms race goes on forever, I think. Uh, we have another paper last year that made quite a bit of noise. So this is an interesting space. The other space is the data that we generate. So um, data from wearable devices, mobile devices. So this data is from these devices that are more or less always with you. And, um, they can indicate a lot of things, your sleep quality, your boredom, your attention span, um, what kind of places you go to at what kind of day. And many companies are after this data as well. Like you see that uh, some companies now, they give you uh, offers and discounts if you wear like wearable devices because they can uh, negotiate your health insurance better. Some gyms have these incentives now. Uh, some car insurance providers, uh, they give you discounts based on, and obviously not being part of this ecosystem is also not easy because uh, if, you're, if you don't have this uh, whatever dash cam or if you don't have this sensor GPS thing installed in your car, then by default you pay the highest premium, so you're subsidizing the rest. Um, Anyway, so yeah, we do quite a bit of work in this space in terms of providing libraries and tools for doing health analytics. Uh, the main problem in this space is that all of these apps and all of these data, they live in isolation. So bringing them together to make some useful analytics, for example, 
what is the correlation between my, the emails that I've been receiving and my mood and my physical activity, things like that, that you know there's some sort of uh, correlation out there, but proving it quantitatively is challenging. It's quite hard today. Finally, there are these devices which are entering our home, and they obviously have some uh, previous issues. Uh, you, there's lots of stories about these IoT devices entering home now because the current race today is to just get into the home. So Google recently released this uh, Google Home, and Apple last week also released their own device. Uh, they announced uh, their Apple Home device, and then there's Amazon Echo, and then these come with a range of privacy issues. Like, for example, I was at my friend's home last week uh, in Singapore, and as I entered the home, I saw that he has one of these uh, Google Home things. So I just shouted, uh, OK, Google, what's my name? And then, uh, OK, Google, um, I just asked a bunch of random questions. And based on uh, the movies that he'd been watching and things like that, it revealed quite a bit about him. And that's, those are not actually the big issues. The big issues are things like the security and privacy of the systems uh, that just get installed. You must have heard the story of uh, there are now websites that you can go and watch people's uh, child monitors, for example. Uh, whatever. Um, scary world out there. Um, also, things like smart meters, for example, they can show a lot about uh, Things like your religion, your behavior, your health, maybe, because they might show how many times at night you wake up to go to the loop, whatever. How's your sleep quality? So these are all indicator of uh, uh, your well-being. And even things that you don't think about. So we had this IoT project last year that we were monitoring plants for uh, growing conditions or so giving feedback to the home growers and stuff like that. that completely not related to privacy, but from the data from that plant, you could easily work out how many people living, live in that house, what religion do they have, what time of day do they wake up, things like that. So because it basically had a light sensor and thermostat and things like that. So clearly, there are opportunities in putting this data together. You can get maybe better health, better understanding of individuals' well-being. You can give personalized feedback to the individual, or it can be useful for, I don't know, surveying things like uh, what's the correlation between people in East London's income and the type of food that they eat and their health level and whatever. But there are challenges as well. Uh, firstly, how do we get this data? Where do we collect it? How do we analyze it without introducing uh, privacy threat? Uh, and most importantly, things which are now becoming a big issue today. Algorithmic bias, accountability, what kind of uh, biases am I introducing into the system? But being part of this system or being out of the system, and lots of uh, yeah, price discrimination, a good example again of this algorithmic bias. Depending on the type of browser that you have, I offer you a different uh, flight price or hotel price because I know that you can afford it if you are using Safari on Mac versus if you are uh, if you seem to be a more savvy user and be using whatever browser on whatever Linux distribution. So <clears throat> the big question that we've been asking in the last couple of years is how can we do detailed user-centric analytics? without all the privacy disasters, and more importantly, legal challenges. There's some data that you just cannot have without have being liable to owning that data. Like Google doesn't want to keep all your search results, because some of the, some of the things that people search for, as soon as that search is made, they have to also make a report to somebody, so it's a hassle for them. So they much rather not have uh, that data about you. So I'm going to talk very briefly about a couple of examples of how we can do privacy-preserving analytics and a platform that we are developing in that space. In the last few years, there was lots of uh, protocols for privacy-preserving analytics, and they all look like this. There's an untrusted dealer in the middle, an untrusted broker serving you ads and stuff, and the dealer uh, anonymizes your clicks and things, and then you have some sort of local profiler thing running. The, challenge that really was preventing some of this, and then there was some efforts on bringing this into reality. But well, the most challenge that uh, was uh, really faced here was that the user still was seeing these approaches as a black box, and 
also there is complex uh, regulatory fr um, issues around uh, dealing with this data. So just to motivate why um, kind of uh, we can do things at the user side. Right, one of the things that was important here was that here we are starting to move away from this model of today that okay, we send everything up to the cloud, some magic machine learning is done there, and then some inference uh, comes back down to me. So here we are moving away from that model and saying, if I'm doing things locally, can I actually improve uh, some sort of inferences or some sort of analytics? For example, if I take a public model of uh, physical activity, for example, all of these um, devices, they have an embedded uh, model for activity recognition, which is trained using a number of people. So they make a number of people walk and run and cycle and whatever, and then they train this public, uh, what you call a public model. And then you put the public model locally, and then you can do activity recognition. But what we've been uh, doing recently was that on a normal phone, we were seeing that if we take the public model <coughs> and start doing local improvements to it, with really small overhead, we can actually go, in the beginning we are kind of, uh, I should have had a laser pointer, but my arm is usually long enough, but not for this one. So in the beginning, ah, sorry, we are struggling, uh, we are struggling to meet the quality of that public model. But as we add more samples, actually our data of what we see as the personal model in blue, it, it's actually outperforming the public model. So local processing or local analytics is um, letting us have a better model of the activity without necessarily uh, jeopardizing the privacy because no data is, uh, is leaking. Oh, thanks very much. Um, aha, right. Thank you. The other example here was, um, uh, and, and yeah, this is a paper that we've recently put on archive. The other example here is like, for example, can we do, let's say there is an app that wants, to, or your doctor wants to know about your social interaction. So they say, ah, can you give me access to your, or there is an app that wants to do your mental well-being or whatever analytics. It says, can you give me access to your pictures? I want to see, for example, uh, how happy are you in all of your Facebook pictures? Whatever, for whatever reason. They want to do just analytics of your social well-being, whatever. And are you happier when you're alone or when you're in your pictures and things like that? So you want, to, you want to make your pictures available to somebody, but you want them to not be able to do face recognition, just do things like, I don't know, gender recognition or mood detection and things like that. So what we were doing in that case, we started uh, breaking down the usual machine learning models into layers. And then we can just do this feature extraction layer locally, and then do the classification layer on the cloud. And so basically, in a way that if you have a deep learning model, you are doing the, um, you're doing the convolution layer locally, and then you do the fully connected layer on the, on the cloud. And this, with a bit of noise adding, works pretty well in a way that you can, um, you can really achieve high precision still on the original tasks that you were trying to do. So for example, if the original task was gender, gender detection in this, uh, in this case, so with a bit of noise adding, we could still achieve really high gender detection while we would really bring down the accuracy of face recognition to like two, two to three percent. So if we are, so again, this is a use case and an example of making data available to others, letting them do assessment on some feature, but preventing them from uh, doing assessment on another feature. Um, so again, this is a recent work that we've put on archive, um, and uh, I encourage you to have a look at it if you are interested in deep learning and privacy. But these are these were just two quick examples of how we can do machine learning. We can do analytics. Uh, we can rely on use of local resources and uh, prevent kind of uh, attacks on features that we don't want revealed. These are all part of a bigger platform that we've been recently working on, which we refer to as Databox. So this is a project that will be running over the next three years. Uh, it's only started six months ago. So there were lots of ideas and there were lots of proposals on making a box for data and then you gave 
selective access to your data. But here we are going away from that model and in a kind of a GDPR sense, we are mediating access to the data. So rather than mediating access, um, mediating like, uh, so rather than um, letting user collect all the data locally in a silo like, um, like some proposals today is that, okay, you have a data box, uh, sorry, you have a Dropbox equivalent. You download all your data and anybody who wants your data, they come and uh, get that data from you. We are trying to provide an ecosystem and a platform for people to understand who wants access to what piece of their data and mediate that access. So you're not trying to collect all your data in one go, you're trying to really make sense of who's accessing your data. and. Uh, yeah, so most importantly, we are going away from this uh, data silo uh, approach. So I will just show you what it looks like in reality. Let's say you have a little uh, box at your home, which is a physical box. At the moment, actually, the data box, we can run it on Raspberry Pi or normal x86 machines. So it's actually a physical box. And it has a bunch of uh, anonymization and uh, the usual uh, encryption techniques, but more importantly, it uh, has access to your local, let's say, IoT devices, and you can connect it to your cloud services and things like that. But here, the difference is that instead of you um, uploading data to the cloud, for example, or giving them access to the data, the app that wants that data piece has to come locally and run um, in a virtual machine. To be more specific, these are all Docker containers. So every app comes, and run, uh, comes down, runs locally, gets access to the data, and let's say it needs to do correlations between your, just understand your smart meter, for example, data, and the devices that you have at home, and how many people live at home, and I don't know, for whatever reason that this smart meter exists. They're usually in order to profile people better. Or one of the partners that we have is BBC. They want to be able to do better profiling of the client and show them and customize basically their TV viewing experience without necessarily getting all the data back at the BBC. And so they're really interested in this, uh, in this space. Um, so connecting to smart TV is something that they're really keen on. So, and, so we enable kind of this, uh, this ecosystem here. And specifically, what happens is that every app comes down, it's running in a virtual machine in a local container. It has access via drivers, via specific uh, drivers for different sensors and actuators to the data that they provide. Now, these can be data from, I don't know, social media or from your smart bed or your smart uh, kettle or whatever that it can be at your home, your personal data. And then that app doesn't actually have direct access to the internet, so it cannot just funnel that uh, data through. The idea is that that app has to do some sort of local processing analytics, then it can just report the outcome of that data. Now, of course, there is a risk that by just putting a zero or one there, for example, it can determine whether, whatever, the user has HIV or not, or, um, or things like that. This is, uh, this is, this is something that um, we are kind of starting to do more research on, and actually we are just recruiting a postdoc specifically to look at the information theory uh, aspects of uh, data release to third parties uh, from this module. But again, still it's better than basically giving away all the data up to the cloud. And there are specific monitors uh, for what data uh, is available to who. Um, and yeah, so one of the important things that we integrated in that is mobile sensing. So we get uh, really efficient sensing, uh, mobile sensing libraries to get data to, so you can embed the data from your mobile phone in the, into the data box as well. So the whole ecosystem looks something like this. You have a bunch of home IoT devices, you have a bunch of social media accounts, and you have some sort of cloud instance of the thing. But this main thing is running at home or as an app on your device, but we don't have that app uh, yet. And it's kind of managing uh, access to all different sources of the data that you have, and it can communicate to the internet and third parties via the specific APIs that you make available. So you have one place to go to, and you see who has access to what data. 
let's say you want to get a new mortgage today, the model today is that you pick three whatever months, three years of your bank account data and your expenses and whatever. You go to the bank or you go to a specific broker and you say, okay, this is all my data, what mortgage shall I get? And obviously they have specific incentives, they get a cut from this mortgage broker and that mortgage advertiser. So they have a biased view of the world as well and they offer you this uh, mortgage. But there is no reason for that mortgage library not to come to you. So, I mean, there are not that many mortgages available in the UK. You're talking about tens of thousands of packages, right? So this is not that much data. It can just come to you locally. You give it access to your, uh, um, so from next year, all the banks are also legally obliged to have APIs. So you give it access to your bank API, and it can say, okay, this specific mortgage is, uh, is best for you. Specifically, somewhere that this thing comes useful, and we, ha we are getting a lot of contact from industry. Um, last week, the biggest, um, one of the biggest uh, energy operators contacted us about this in Europe is GDPR. So we are trying to make DataWise a place uh, to um, really implement GDPR and give access uh, to the data, um, give consent for access to the data. But uh, yeah, I'm not going to go through that. And oh, more, most importantly, this is completely an open source project, and the code and everything is available on the project page. Um, and this was a picture from uh, Mozilla Fire, uh, Mozilla Festival uh, um, a couple of months ago now. So this, these, are, these people are watching a specific TV program. Uh, it's a cooking program. And they have a bunch of smart utensils. Based on the speed of their cooking and the kind of ingredients that they have available to them, on the fly, the program is customized to them. So, if you're trying to watch a cooking program and you're a bit slow or you don't have this kind of thing, you're customizing the program and then, so yeah, each of them was doing something else and uh, it kind of worked pretty okay. So, I mean, anyway, this, we are treating this as a community project and getting involvement of uh, people with real devices and uh, things like that. And uh, that's about it. Uh, I will not go through future work, but it's mostly about enabling uh, the community engagement with this because we nearly have the platform ready a little bit ahead of the time and now what we are doing is engaging with a lot of people to get more apps uh, into this ecosystem. Um, and yeah, that's uh, it. So in conclusion, personal data analytics is not going to go away. The internet is not going to change overnight. You're not going to get free email and Facebook without giving anything away. So instead of dreaming and imagining that we can turn the whole thing upside down, we have to think about methods that respect the current uh, operation mode of uh, everybody, but it also respects the individual privacy. Um, edge processing, edge computing, methods like data box, basically user center processing are enablers in this space, but there is uh, much more work to be done to understand the optimization between the amount of resources that you have locally available versus the bandwidth that you are happy to give away versus the amount of data that you are happy to give away versus the amount of data that others want you to give away but you want to stop them uh, from doing that. And yeah, for the papers and links to the projects and software, just see my web page. Thank you very much. Hi, first of all, thank you for uh, explaining everything so that I don't have to talk too much about the introduction later. That's good. Uh, but I was just wondering, because you put everything into one place now, is it not a risk of putting all your eggs in one basket? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so most importantly, the data itself never comes to the box. What happens is that, uh, I didn't go through the too much details, but what happens is that you have very, very short-lived uh, authorization tokens available to the apps Let's say an app comes and wants to do analytics between your physical activity for the day, which comes from your phone, your what kind of day you had on social media, which comes from your Facebook and Instagram and stuff like that, and the quality of your sleep, which comes from your smart bed at home. So three completely separated data sources. That arbiter uh, module is just minting tokens uh, there and then, so that, that uh, container manager and the arbiter. They just mint tokens, the app gets temporary access to that amount of data that it needs if it's one day 
So this is uh, an authorization technique uh, which uh, is by Google called Google Macaroons. So they are not cookies, they are macaroons. They are like short-lived <laughs> cookies. Uh, so uh, it gets a short-term access, gets that data, does the analytics, and then the, you kill the container and everything. So you never give, like, let's say, username and passwords, or you don't give your actual OAuth uh, token. You're just giving short-term access. Uh, so you're not kind of creating a hub uh, at home, of you, uh, like a silo or a, or a honeypot in a way. Now, for IoT devices at home, this is a different story. For IoT, we are kind of starting to treat the data box now as a firewall for the home. So instead of keeping everything uh, like the model today is that you install a device at home and it has direct access to the internet, we want to introduce the data box as a firewall uh, for the home uh, device. But uh, because there is live streaming, I cannot go into more details. <laughs> I was just wondering, um, you had the chart which which sort of showed if you had, say, for example, a, a nest or something, what the the granularity of the information that you can see um, through look at some through looking at someone's mm -hmm. um, energy usage. Yeah. And so um, I'm sure you explained it, and I just didn't understand it. But what would be the impact of um, what you're creating on the granularity of the information that then is sent back to say the owner? So um, if you think that your systems would, this is like a follow-up question, mm -hmm. would um, reduce that um, and perhaps the impetus is that it's GDPR compliant, do you think that would then have an impact, say, in America where they don't have data protection, where, um, you know, they're, they're, these kind of things are just rolled out by the, at, at a state level mm -hmm. and, and so that, you know, you occasionally hear of, of cases um, like in Napaville where they're resisting it, but mm -hmm. it's very hard to resist the the fact that, that granularity is sent, and it's, it's more wanting yeah. to have the option of one that doesn't send that amount. Yeah, um, right. So one of the things that we are trying to do, um, which I will, I, I just have it in one of the slides, is trying to communicate to the user the different granularities and uh, what risks or what kind of mode of operation you have. So you have this kind of sample rate uh, for different devices and stuff like that. So depending on different sample rates, the app has to communicate what it does. So if I, if I give you access to my weekly versus hourly versus per second access to my thermostat, what will the app do and what are the risks and benefits? And uh, this is something that we don't have fully up and running yet, but as a result of that, your SLA and your manifest uh, will have to adjust themselves ba uh, based on the user's uh, choices. Now, communicating this to the ordinary user is a whole different, it's actually a third of the project is just about this, that how do you communicate this bit to the user? Um, so right now we are going with the model of making the system have these options and making them available and then dealing with uh, in the meantime, as part of uh, the user studies, so this is an EPSRC project, uh, as part of the user studies that we are doing and the deployments, trying to understand if anybody would care about this or they would just go with the default of the app anyway, which is most likely what will happen. Um, but I mean, a part of it is about having this ecosystem available that uh, some person who's uh, developing some, uh, who's got, who's kind of putting an app out there, doesn't say that, look, um, there's only one way, I need access to your accelerometer or I need access to your GPS. And that's it, they just get perpetual access to the GPS. Now you can go and negotiate to them and say that, if you're Uber, why do you need access to my GPS all the time when I'm not using the app? Which is now, for example, a good example because Apple just, with the new iOS, is enforcing that. That even if the app is requesting perpetual access to a sensor, you can only allow it when the app is running in the foreground. Uh, so I think a part of it, a part of it is uh, about enabling ways that a regulator or the users can challenge the requests uh, which are made by uh, by data brokers basically so yeah it's about having those options yeah so
So as an end user at the moment, it seems that actually you don't actually really have any choice. Even if you can find out these things, yeah. the point is you either can exist in the digital mm -hmm. world or you can drop out of it. So yeah. how, how this only kind of works if, you, if there's some way of encouraging alternative providers to Uber, for example, mm. who can survive without having to yeah. collect all this data that you don't want. And that, it somehow seems that what's needed is, is a different business model, because everybody's rushing to this business model of we collect all your data, and that's the way we make money. And yeah. unless there's some other way that people are operating that doesn't require them to do that to survive, then we're never going to have any choice, and it doesn't matter what data yeah. we see about uh, yeah. what this they is, do. This is, uh, this is a spot-on uh, comment, actually. So that's exactly the model today, because somebody like Uber comes along and says, I'm providing a service, I need access to GPS. And until, for example, last week, you only had one mode, either access or no access. But if the system is enforcing, uh, so there's, there's two fights to be fought here. One of them is the regulatory thing that somebody comes along and says, look, Uber, why do you need access to the location at the middle of the night if somebody took a, a ride two weeks ago with you? So that's, that's the number one thing. The second one is that the system has the ability to, to provide the requests of the, of the thing. So if somebody comes along and says, I want to understand the home occupancy of the user and offer them a better energy deal, currently they say, OK, I, I, I'll come, I'll get installed on their phone, I ask for access to their Nest uh, thermostat and whatever, and then I have perpetual access to their thing. But at least if you have a system that has these choices, you can then fight also the regulatory fight that, look, you don't need per minute or per second access. You can just get a weekly summary of this thing. And I can summarize it for you. I can run some local distribution building and just give you a weekly distribution if, that's, uh, if, th if that is all that you're interested in. So they have to justify getting more and more data. So I think these two, fight, these two kind of battles need to go in but parallel. That One of them is the regulators and the legal aspects. One of them is the technology people that they need to provide ways that uh, we go beyond the binary mode today that I'm either in the system or I'm not in the system and I have to hail a cab every time and uh, pay five times more because that's the model that the, there's a non-tracking system and there's a fully tracking system and uh, so it, which is I mean there's lots of projects specifically on digital exclusion and things like that that if you don't want to be part of the system you just pay the maximum amount because they can't get any data from you so it's yeah, I mean, I don't have an answer to your uh, to your question. I mean, it's it's, a very, it's, a, it's exactly the way that today's world is operating. It's just that we need to, yeah, work with regulators and technologies to enable these options and to get the user a bit more empowered that they can have these choices that they can click on the, and maybe the app will stop working. Just like today, I just go and kill my location, and Google Maps says. I need access to your location, otherwise I can't navigate. You can navigate it offline, but in order to navigate, you need to actually access to the location. So, yeah. But it's not always actually about you have to pay more. So, smart water meters, for example. Yeah, you don't have a choice. Smart yeah, yeah, yeah. water meters, yeah. we just had one yeah. installed. I had no choice yeah. whatsoever. I was told, you are now having a smart water yeah, meter. Yeah. You know, so, it's about do I want water or not? If yeah, I yeah. If if I've got a problem with the privacy, I won't have water. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's an even more complex thing. I mean, so in Holland, for example, the smart meter thing got delayed because people kind of resisted it uh, a lot. And here, it's still an optional thing. It's still not by force. But the smart water thing is a good example because it's by force. It's coming to an, our area as well. And you either have no water or you have a smart meter. So. Uh, yeah, at least if you want to make the smart meter, uh, your energy meter data available to somebody else, uh, at least with a system like this, you can have a choice that somebody can come and say, OK, I'm whatever. You know, every now and then British gas comes to your door, then Scottish energy comes, then EDF comes. And so, so maybe you can run an app that says, OK, access my next data for a year, or my smart meter data for a year, and tell me currently what energy provider is best for me. 
maybe it's better than the model today that you just wait for somebody to come and knock on your door or, or some broker which is biased anyway because they get a cut from somebody. My question is about the open source. Uh, mm. So when you say open source, what uh, part of, uh, what is exactly mean open source? Is it? Uh, the, um, the platform is fully open source. Uh, the data box itself, everything is open source. What does not have to be open source is the apps. So the app provider, they don't have to make, uh, they don't have to make the actual app open source. Uh, so this, this bit, but uh, so this local app doesn't have to be open source, but everything else is uh, completely open source. So you can, I don't know, install audit points, uh, or somebody can come around, uh, like 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 Linux in a way, right? Uh, so you can install, you can run your own programs on it and things like that. The idea is that you're opening the door for auditing and things like that. A bit like Android. Android is actually a better example. Uh, so Android is open source, right? But you don't have to make your app open source. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks very much.